That's so good. So proud. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so good. Hot. Oh, yeah. Sit down. Sit down. Hello. Am I on? Yeah. I haven't done anything yet, guys, so um, maybe, just, maybe just wait. No, it's fine. Um, what a beautiful night. That was such a good word, Gabe, wherever you are, about hope. Um, I just felt a lot of weight on that. My, um, my niece got baptized tonight. I did not know that. Little Ava. Oh my gosh, a mess. Um, hmm. And um, Bethany uh, Foreman, blonde gal right here, just led Our Father, which is just such, that will forever be a significant song for me. I will never forget the day that I, that I um, led that song for the first time. Never led that before. It was about an hour 15 into a worship set. And um, Hunter was the only one. That was Hunter's song. If you didn't know that, Hunter's the one that brought that song to our world. And... Um, and I remember it was one of those moments, the set wasn't going well, but something began to shift in the, in the room, and, and uh, we came to this crazy moment, and I'm like, I'm supposed to sing this song, and I'd never sung that song before, I didn't even know all the right lyrics, and um, so I start out just super timid, I'm like, our father, and then you're committed, so I'm like, in my head, I'm scrambling um, for the words, but I will never forget that night. I'll never forget what the Lord did. Um, yeah, his glory just began to manifest in the room in such an intense and beautiful way. And I've never stopped kind of waiting for it, you know, um, ever since then. So it's an honor. It's a privilege. We've been here seven years, um, which is crazy. It feels like yesterday, and it also feels like dog years at Bethel because um, I feel like I've been here for at least 14. Uh, that's, that's more like what it feels like. But... Um, so grateful to be here with you guys. It's a crazy honor, um, and uh, never in my wildest dreams did I, did I think I would find myself here standing behind this pulpit, and um, before I think about that too long and completely become a, yeah, a wreck, um, I just want to launch in here. Let's just pray. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would breathe confidence in this room, the confidence of God invade this place tonight. Fill our hearts, fill our minds, fill our bodies. Just release a holy conviction in our hearts tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. I want to talk about conviction, um, living from conviction. This is a word that's been stirring in my spirit. Um, for some time, and I'll, it's actually a very personal word for me, um, which is hard, the harder word to give <laughs> is the ones that are very personal to you, and you're a little bit in the middle of the process, if you guys um, know what I'm talking about. So um, I've been in this season of growing in confidence, which is very interesting for me um, because it's not necessarily something I've ever struggled with before or I've not been aware of the areas that I haven't um, maybe been as strong as I, as I would have thought. So I, um, about six to eight months ago, something in that, in that, in that realm or area, I, um, I started being crazy insecure. And uh, to the point, particularly in worship, like I'd be fine in just about every other context, but for some reason in worship and leading worship, I would get crazy insecure. And um, uh, there was one point, it was during a leader's advance, and I am, I am trying to sing. I'm trying to sing my hardest. And um, my voice is literally cracking. I feel like I am more than normal, for those of you who, who know how I sing. It's not like that's a crazy, unnormal thing, but far more than normal. And I'm reaching for notes, and there's nothing there, and I feel like I am falling apart on the inside. And this is like six years into my journey here. It's not like I didn't feel established in this community. It's not like, um, and in my head, I'm, I'm having such 
a battle, such a wrestle. Um, because I'm like, I feel like I should be at a stage in my life and a stage in this house where I'm operating in the more confidence than I've ever operated in ever before. And instead, I'm struggling to make it through a set right now. And um, obviously, I feel one of the things that was um, super good that I've learned here is you ask God questions. It's been a super helpful tool for me to ask the Lord what the, what the heaven is going on in <laughs> my heart, okay? Um, this needs to end, or I need to quit, or, or, or something. Uh, maybe it's my season, maybe it's my time to just stop, or whatever. It was all these, these questions are, are going through my head. And um, I just began to ask the Lord, and I, it, was, it was like this, this impression that was just so strong. And he said, Jer, the thing that I want to do with your life, the things that I want to grow you in, the areas of authority that I want you to step into, in order to take that territory, you are going to need to deal with the level of inner conflict you have carried around most of your life. There's an area that you will not be able to go and operate in that kind of insecurity. Um, it'll, it'll kill you. And um, not kill me, it's so dramatic, but you guys understand what I'm saying. There's questions. You see, he began to speak to me about questions. He says, there's questions that you've entertained that you can no longer entertain. You can no longer tolerate an insecure, orphaned way of thinking. And you can no longer live without these deep convictions. And I think, I remember this, I'm saying this, you need to believe I am who I say that I am and that you are who I say that you are, which is sometimes the bigger deal. I don't have a lot of, I don't have a lot of problem believing that God is who he says that he is, but sometimes I have a, it's much different when you have to receive who he says that you are. And he said that you need to be confident in a way that's absolutely foreign to you. Um, I don't like introductions. Um, Eric did that on purpose because he loves me so much. And uh, no, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, you know what's funny about God is he doesn't deal with your issues all at once. Isn't that funny? I've lived with like an immense amount of internal conflict my entire life. And I'm like, why now, Lord? Why, why now are you having me deal with this um, thing? It was normal. But you know what's funny? What's crazy is that in one season, what's normal will kill you in the next. Because where the Lord's leading you, it's just never the same. When you have your yes to the Lord, well, for one, that's the craziest, most amazing, beautiful, scary place to be is just to have a continual yes. Not just a yes for a season, but like a yes for the rest of your life. It just means, you know, Eric was talking about pruning this morning, and it was, um, but it's that whole thing of like, you're a part of a vineyard. Your yes to the Lord, if you're abiding with the Lord, there's going to be coming seasons where you get pruned. If your yes is for him and he is your vine dresser, guess what? It's just really exciting. That's all. That's all there is to it. So um, I want to talk about being a people of deep conviction, a people of great faith, and a people of outrageous confidence in God, which I barely feel qualified to speak on. But Maybe that's why I'm going to do it. Um, let me just clarify, though. Conviction, the kind of conviction that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about conviction of sin. I fully believe in that. I pray for it on lots of different people on a, on a regular basis, but uh, it's, not, it's not what I'm talking about tonight. Um, also, conviction, um, I'm not talking, there's a, there's, a, there's a vast difference between having a conviction and knowing uh, a truth or, or, or a fact. I don't know if you guys have ever been in a casual conversation. You could be talking about the weather. Uh, you can be talking about food. You can be talking about politics. Um, you can be talking about any number of things, and it's nice and casual. It's lighthearted. And then all of a sudden, somebody just begins to speak, and you're like, what is this heat that I'm feeling off of you right now? Like, there's a weight in which you are speaking and um, I, have you guys ever been in that kind of situation? What you just did is you just stepped on the landmine of someone's conviction, and, and you had no idea. <laughs> it happens a lot to people who talk to me. We're just having an innocent, sweet conversation, and all of a sudden I get really intense, and I'm like, no, 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 you know? And um, <laughs> it's a conviction. Convictions are things we carry at our core. They shape our lives. They shape our choices, and they are essential for impact. And influence. And three things I really want us as believers to know about faith, about conviction, 
I think are massive for us. The first thing I want us to know is that it's actually who we are. We were made to be a people of great faith. One of the things that's happening in the church today that I'm, I think is amazing, it's almost like the church is getting re-evangelized. It's like they're discovering the gospel again. I was just with Todd White up in Canada, and um, you guys know Todd. He's such a dear guy. I don't, I've never even had a coffee with him. Um, we've had a, a few more chances to interact, but I just remember one night he just comes up, he just looked at me, he's crying tears in his eyes. He's just like, I love you, man. I love you. And I'm like, I love you too. Uh, <laughs> no, I do though. I do actually felt really sincere. I'm like, no, I, I love you. I've never even had a conversation with you, but I really, really love you. And he just is that kind of guy. But he was up there and he was just preaching the gospel. And it was crazy. Like, I have never felt that level of just like kind of thunder in the atmosphere. And I'm like, he's just talking about the gospel to the church. And um, it's, it's, there's just certain things that for whatever reason, they fall off their pedestal. They, 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 they stop being the core, the center of, of our message. And one of those things is faith. God's gift to us was conviction, not confliction, but conviction. And I looked that up. That's an actual word in the dictionary in case you just think I made up a word. It's confliction. It's uh, to be conflicted. We are not meant to be to live as a conflicted people. We were meant to live as a deeply convicted people, holding deep beliefs, deep truths. And the whole thing about Jesus just blows my mind because sometimes in the church, um, things get more and more confusing. And what's wild to me is I can understand that from an Old Testament perspective. I can understand in a lot of ways, but Jesus came, took on flesh, lived 30 plus years of his life um, here with us to demonstrate, give us a physical representation of who God is and what God is like. He did not come to further our confusion. He came to give us a solid foundation where if we'd had any confusion or conflicting thoughts about who God was or who God is or how God operates, all of a sudden we have God in the flesh and we're like, I see you. I see who you are. I see you in what you're doing. It's a firm foundation. And we are no longer to live in a conflicted state. He gave us something to to believe in. I've already said that. Unsure about ourselves and unsure about God we serve. Locked up in insecurity. I think that one of the reasons why that song, No Longer Slaves, is so powerful because it's really just touching on this. This whole thing of like, we are no longer slaves to fear. We're no longer slaves to this conflicted, I don't know, I'm insecure. Like, we are no longer slaves to this. We have a new nature, and at the core of our new nature is faith. So whatever you used to be, I'm a recovering cynicaholic is what I tell people. So whatever you used to be, whether you used to be a cynic, whether you used to be a skeptic or a doubter, the good news is you are no longer. You are no longer. You are a new faith-filled creation with a faith-filled nature, which means that you now major in belief, not doubt, You're not designed to doubt anymore. You're only designed to believe. I just want you to, I want to read some scripture here. And I just, really, it's it's more for you guys just to catch the tone. You know when when a topic just begins to scream at you that you've kind of just ignored? You've read those verses all of your life and it just begins to scream. Um, Just scream. (laughs) Hebrews. I'm just going to dance around Hebrews. So um, I'm not even going to tell you scriptures. I'm just going to read, all right? Because it's it's just a lot. You know what's so embarrassing is that I forgot my Bible tonight. And uh, it's terrible, terrible to show up at church when you're about to preach and realize that you did not bring your Bible. But I did print out these scriptures. No, I have them memorized. She just told you no, they're memorized. No. Um, <laughs> Hebrews 3, 6, I, uh, whatever. But Christ is faithful over God's house as a son, and we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. Skip me down to the end of chapter four. It says, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace. 1019, therefore, brothers, since we have 
guys are getting it, to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Finally, the all-famous verse here. That I'm really gonna, this is what I wanna get at. Faith is the assurance depending on your version, of things hoped for. The conviction, the I know that I know that I know of things not seen. Faith is who you are. Faith is who we are. Number two, it's required to do the job. The territory that's in front of us, I think, part of the reason why I'm sharing this and exposing what I'm in the middle of my process in is because sometimes the Lord does these prophetic things and he will drag me through a process that I realize is not just for me, it's actually for more. And I'm literally just sharing my process because I feel the same thing, that there's territory for me that I I have to deal with a level of insecurity in me and I have to grow in in confidence. That, That territory cannot be accessed any other way. I feel the same thing for us as a people and us as a church. And I'm not just talking in a corporate way. I feel like there's things in front of you guys. There's things that you're called to take down. Um, there's things that you're called to take. Uh, maybe, this, maybe this language is not, is not the best, but there, there's land you're called to take, that you're called to occupy, but that you will not be able to do that in insecurity or in doubting or in questioning. You will have to step into a place of faith. You will have to begin to live from deep, deep, Conviction. And if you want to know what deep, deep conviction looks like, it's me right now. Every time I start to speak, I'm like, why? God, why? I don't want to do this. I don't. But I'm called to. But I'm called to. All right, so good. There's territory that will only be taken by the Joshua and the Caleb's, by men and women of great confidence. I don't know if you think about this often, but our assignment here on the earth is crazy. It takes like an insane amount of faith to just believe that it's possible, you know? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, preach the gospel, disciple nations, make disciples, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus commanded. You know what's crazy about that? If you think the pastoral assignments are easier than the raising the dead ones, you've never pastored anybody. And uh, those are challenging, challenging things. Uh, And the only way to fulfill our task here on the earth is to believe with every fiber in our being, not in our own stuff, but in our God and who he is and who he's called us to be. And I just see there's so much breakthrough that is locked up. It's locked up in like storehouses only to be accessed by people who are moving with a deep conviction, who are filled with a great faith. A people who aren't conflicted, who aren't conflicted about the nature of God. They aren't conflicted about what he wants to do on the earth. They're not conflicted about his heart for people. You know what's interesting about the parable of the talents is that the guy that it didn't go well for was the most conflicted person. And the people that just, I mean, I don't know, you don't, you don't know the story. It just says to one was given 10 and the other five and the other one. And, you know, it's just like, apparently, the, the guy who just took 10 was not a conflicted person. It was literally like, we're going to multiply this, we're going to get after it, and we're going to see it happen, you know? And then the guy with the five, same thing, just confidence. Like, hey, we're going to, this, we know what to do. But the guy that it did not go well for was the one that was deeply conflicted. He's like, I don't know, you're this kind of master. And I was basically scared out of my mind, so I buried it. Not a good plan. We need great faith. Number three, again, reiterating, it's what we need a lot more of um, in my life, yes, Lord, and in yours. I just want to make a couple leadership observations. I, I have mentored a lot of young worship leaders, um, and obviously in Tribe, mentoring a lot of young uh, leaders, period. And one of the things that's so interesting to me, particularly about worship leaders, 
is there's a lot of this kind of conversation about, I, I listen to people, they, they, they just chat about worship and, and they say things that they probably shouldn't say, but it's, it's humorous to me half the time. But they're just like, oh, I just love that leader. She or he is just so anointed, so anointed. And, and in another way, they're like, oh, that other leader, I just, I don't, I don't. I don't feel the anointing on their life or or everything kind of rises or falls based on our anointing. And you know what I found to be so curious is that half the time actually having a relationship with those leaders, I'm like, what you're feeling is not their, I mean, it's in part, hear me, it's in part their anointing, but what you're actually encountering is their level of confidence. It's their level of conviction. And um, because I've watched people in different settings like, Um, We all have those moments where, for whatever reason, we have enough confidence. We're able to wrestle down the demons that are in our head trying to talk to us, and we're able to actually step into something and break through into something, and all of a sudden, lo and behold, people think we're anointed. (laughs) When really, all we did was step into a place of boldness and began to let a conviction and the fire of a conviction come out of us. And I've seen worship leaders who... um, their anointing is, is alive and well, but, it, but it, it's not able to come out because of their level of insecurity, because they're not able to pull on a deep conviction. And the, the other, obviously, side of this is true. The anointed, the anointed leaders, the people moving in power, um, I've, I've gotten around people that are moving in something that I really want to move in. And, you know, we have a culture where it's like, can you give me your anointing? Please pray. I'll, you know, I'll impart this and impart that and that kind of a thing. And I'm as hungry as the next person, you know, maybe, maybe not quite as weird or brazen, but um, <laughs> which maybe means I'm not quite as hungry. But um, I like getting around these people. Like I, I, I watch them. I study them. I'm like, what is it about you that enables you to move in some of these ways so powerfully that I long for? And you know what I found as I began to rub shoulders with some of these men and women? Is that, for one, they're not conflicted. <laughs> well, not, not in the area that they're moving in great power. And what I've, what I've, what I've come for is, you know, I'm like, I want to see your anointing at work. And what I've actually been forced to encounter is the depth of their conviction. And that's been the thing. That, that's rocked me. And um, I would be so bold as to say that I dare you to try and find a leader who's operating in great anointing and in great power that it's not tied to a deep conviction about the nature of God, about the truth of God that they have held and stewarded for many, many years. And there is this interesting blend. I'm not saying there's not anointing involved. I'm just saying that there is something that releases our anointing. It says the spirit of the God is, you know, is upon me, has anointed me, to do X, Y, and Z. If that's already the case, then what are we lacking? Conviction. You know, I just, sometimes if you just want to think about conviction, you know, personified, it's like Lou Angle. Lou Angle just... Literally, like he's vibrating, I, I think, mo- most of the time. But you don't gather 70,000 people in the Coliseum in the middle of Los Angeles without some real, real deep conviction. And I, um, Bill Johnson, such, wow, um, I've learned so much from him. about confidence, about authority, because it's such a different manifestation, but it's no less powerful. And um, just little things like we read in the children's offering. Like, do you realize just how straight up confident <laughs> that offering reading is? I am powerful. <laughs> Her, you know? Like, I'm important. How God made me is amazing. I'm going to change the ever-loving world. Like, we're just so confident, and I I just love it. Um, I do. It's just, I I I remember our first offering readings, I would just be here. And, you know, I've been exposed to a lot of things in church, but I'd never been exposed to that. And I just sit there, just like, just marvelous smile on my face going, I can't believe we're reading this. Jobs and better jobs. Finding, I mean, just like, 
very, very confident. Um, but the beautiful thing to me about this environment, what Bill has so championed, it's not a conflicted environment. It's not conflicted. There's no one who has here on a prayer line who's going to be conflicted about whether or not God wants to heal you. There's just not any, no one's having that kind of conversation. God's in a good mood. This very, very simple phrase, what is it doing? What is it intended to do? It's, it's basically all of this stuff. I am important. God is in a good mood, loves me all the time. It's literally just Bethel is being used to breathe confidence back into the church that has grown deeply insecure about who God is. And they have forgotten the core fundamentals of who he is. So yes, let's cry out for a greater anointing, but just in the same breath, like God, give us a deeper conviction of who you are, a deeper faith, a deeper boldness. All right. Practically, how do I grow in confidence, deal with insecurity, and begin to live from deep conviction? Um, I've written a list of things that I think are important to champion. Um, some of this is just, it's not going to be rocket science. So um, first step, know your core convictions. What are your core convictions? I don't know if you guys have ever asked yourself that question of what is at the core of me? What are my convictions? What are those things that I get heated about? Like when someone starts talking about something, I'm like, I mean, I, they're not hard to spot. Maybe you just haven't been aware. Like what are these things that get you? that get you. Leadership to me can be summed up in this. It's someone who brings a people into alignment or agreement with their deep inner core conviction. It's really true. So if you don't know your convictions, you're probably not doing a great job of leading people. And if you don't think you're a leader, I subscribe to Banning Leapshire's uh, view on this, and he says every Christian is a leader. Every Christian is called to lead a world into an encounter with God. There's leadership in some form, in some capacity, because you are a son or a daughter of God. Leadership is part, is part of it. So ask the question, what are my convictions? And here's the thing, the most common conviction that I encounter, particularly within a worship community or just dealing with leaders, period, is that, is that I go like, okay, why, you know, they're like, I just... The thing that I hear over and over and over and over again, it's actually beautiful. I don't mean to, to downplay this. Is I just know that I'm called to do this. I know I'm supposed to do that. I know I'm supposed to be up there on stage. I know I'm supposed to preach for thousands. Like, I just know that I know that I'm supposed to do this thing. And I'm like, wonderful. <laughs> wonderful. That is absolutely the first step. But once you get the microphone, What's your conviction? You're there. You've made it. Where are you taking people? Like what actually burns in your heart to do? You need way more than just a conviction that you're called to do something. <laughs> uh, you know what makes for a very ineffective worship leader? It's not actually a bad voice. It's not a bad musical skill set, although those things are, are very... Very helpful, helpful for worship leaders. <laughs> what makes a truly ineffective worship leader is when they lack conviction about the worth of God. I've seen people who are terrible singers and guitar players bring a room into an encounter because they're so convinced that God is worthy. And they lead with this conviction that is so compelling. I mean, I've discovered this personally, that I am a terrible worship leader when I am not thoroughly convinced of the worth of God. And it's happened on multiple occasions where I just didn't come in with that fire and it just was a downward spiral. But in my journey, I don't know that if my anointing has grown so much as my deep convictions have grown, and I can walk you through these shifts that have taken place in my life as a worship leader of these moments where a conviction was birthed and it was born um, in me. I, I, I can take you to this one time I was sitting down and I was watching a, a Coldplay concert. 
And um, I've shared this, you know, before. And I'm just, they, the band had not even started to play. And all I began to see was 10,000 people screaming, like losing their minds. And there was this moment of holy jealousy that rose up in me. out of like this conviction literally laid a hold of my heart. Like, I see it. Like, I know what this is supposed to look like. I know what worship is supposed to look like. Like, I'm getting a picture right now of what every gathered time with the church is supposed to look like. I, I can see it as clear as day. God is worth that, and I know that I know that I know that he's worth that. I mean, I could take you back. I remember a time, you know, we talk about those moments where the Holy Spirit just puts you on like a glove, you know? <laughs> and I have, I have one of those moments where um, I don't know what was even going on with me, but I was just in a zone. Like in a, in a crazy zone. And I just began to lead worship. This was during Worship View. I think it was like 2013. And I'm, and I'm just beginning to lead. And something like in the middle of that service, I became so <laughs> utterly convinced of the worthiness of God. Like it was wild. So, we, you know, it's a, a whole bunch of international students. And so I just began to be like, it was funny. We, we kind of had a down moment in the song. And I, I think I scared people, but I'm like, who's here from another nation? Like, who is here from another nation? And I'm like, right now, begin to sing in your own language. Like, God is worthy of your nation. He's worthy of your nation. And they're like, oh, yes, sir. And, uh, you know, like that kind of a... I don't... Those moments don't happen all, all, all the time. And again, I'm not puffing or, you know, trying to toot my own horn. It was just one of those moments where a conviction was formed. It actually had nothing to do with me, my skill set, how well my voice was going, how well the set was going. It was just, I was all of a sudden, all I could, all I could see and know is that God was worthy of the nations of the earth to come together and worship. And so I said, begin to sing in your own tongue. And then we went back into the song and they have this really hilarious audio clip that Hans, Hans I think has a place to himself when he needs entertainment. And, uh, <laughs> but, but I just began yelling at the nations of the earth, not yelling at them, but it was like, I'm like, England, China, France, Slovakia, yeah! You're like. <laughs> like, you're worthy of the nations, and I'm just, you're worthy of the nations. I remember watching back going like, what was going on with me? <laughs> like, I don't even know. It was so otherly. But I remember also thinking that I'm like, I like that guy. Like, I want to be that guy a whole lot more often. Whoever to happen to that guy, like, let's make that happen lots, lots, lots more. Because that was like the truest version of myself. It was the most convicted I've ever been as a worship leader. And when you truly get in touch, like when I truly got in touch with the worth of God. It was like nothing else mattered. Like, I don't care what you think of me. I don't care who's giving me accolades. I don't care who's giving me criticism. I don't care whether you're confirming my calling or whether you're denying that I have a calling. Like nothing else matters when you are convinced of who God is and the worth of God. It's like, I'm compelled. I have a microphone, you're gonna know it. Like, you're gonna know this fire that is within me. What are your convictions? What are these things that burn in you? Where are the, the journeys that the Lord has led you on that have, that have um, had these moments where you've had like, like an epiphany or, or just a moment of clarity where like, I get it, I know. What are your convictions? Be led by them, let them be seen on you. And you don't have to have a lot one of my favorite examples of just someone who just holds convictions so well is Stephanie Gretzinger. And she's, um, well, she holds it in, in her own way. I have lots of people that I know actually have crazy convictions that they, they hold. But, um, but uh, she'll just feast on a song. Trying to get a set list out of Stephanie Gretzinger. It's just a joy. It's a joy and a privilege. <laughs> Until she finds the song of her season. And then your next 18 set list are all taken care of. Because you just, like, what do you want to do? King of my heart? Okay, sweet. King of my heart. Let's get it. 
You are good. Slap it, slap it, slap it. <laughs> Second thing. <laughs> Second thing. Um, you have to grow your convictions. You need to know what they are and you need to grow them. Convictions require feeding. They actually perish without the right nutrition. You, you can't think of them like stoic little objects that you achieve once and like trophies and you put them on a shelf and they're, they're yours forever. They, they don't work like that. They're more like tender plants. They need love. They need care. They need frequent attention to produce the fruit that you want them to. And if you want more boldness, if you want more confidence when you're being called upon to lead or carry more responsibility in an area, you have to feed your convictions till their fire eclipses your fear. And just speaking about tonight, like, you know, when Eric asked me, I, I was doing an email, I don't know who actually asked me to speak. But um, again, my initial reaction is to be scared to death. Like, that's 100% the truth. Like, and you guys, I don't know if you know what it's like to be well, scared to death, but it's like this my heart just, <sighs> and then every time I think about like speaking, I'm like, <sighs> just, you know, oh, down, down. Um, <laughs> And what I've realized in all these situations, because I've been put in them on a regular basis ever since I got to Bethel, I remember being so scared to death when I realized that um, I did not have the power to end my own sets, that somebody, whoever, was at their whim, and, and they could make me sing a lot longer than I really wanted to sing. And if no one came up to rescue me, I remember that made me so anxious. And um, it's been like that thing. But at the same time, you're like made for it. And so what I used to do in those situations is just realize like, oh my gosh, this requires a fire. This requires me to build a fire that will eclipse my fear, a conviction, feeding. I'm going to feed a conviction until it's the thing that outweighs my fear. So I'm not just an insecure mess trying to be true to my calling. Number three, deal with your double-mindedness. This is a crazy verse here, guys, I'm going to read. It's James chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. It says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man unstable in all his ways. That's a crazy, crazy verse if you really meditate on it. Like, if you're going to ask something of God, believe it completely, 100%. Don't doubt it at all. If you doubt it, you're like a wave that's just in the middle of the ocean being tossed to and fro, and you are unstable in all of your ways. And I realize that as a leader, that's the very thing that the Lord is, is addressing and has been addressing is like, you have a double mind. In one second, you're on this holy, rah, you know, and you're declaring the truth. And the next second, you're questioning everything. He's like, that's, that's a double mind. It's making you unstable in all of your ways. I believe that one of the greatest works of God in our lives, apart from paying in blood for our redemption is the removal of doubt and the deep crippling insecurity in our lives and the infusion of faith, confidence, and full assurance. God is transforming a bunch of people from being doubters into believers. That's literally what he's about. And we have to begin to deal with doubt as the destructive creature that it is because doubt destabilizes everything you are trying to build. And easier said than done. I understand that. So um, here's how do you actually kill this, kill this thing um, called doubt. Number one, I think you just need to recognize it. Um, my dear friend, Jason Valden, who is a treasure to this church, has been a massive treasure to me. He was actually the first person to pursue me um, at this church. And um, I didn't even know why. And he would just call me up and just want to hang out all the time. <laughs> I'm like, I don't understand, but I like it. And yes, and um, we didn't have any friends or anything up here, so it was beautiful. But he's obviously has a massive gift in understanding human hearts. And he just would talk to me. He's like, what's your self-talk like? And I'm like, what's my self-talk like? I'm like, what are you? I don't know. But he taught me to pay attention to my self-talk. 
And the negative thought process, one of the things I've begun to understand is that I have so many crazy negative thought processes in my head all the time. It's like a constant conflicting murmur, like a dialogue in my head. How many of you guys have ever had like a devil's advocate kind of tape playing in your head all the time? Yeah? You know what's crazy is that that might not be the devil's advocate. It may actually be the devil. It's true. And I'll be in these situations where I will, and it's, it's never in the middle of it. I'll tell you right now, like after I teach my brain, if, if I open myself up to it, it's going to go some crazy places, which I'm not going to open myself up to it, which is good. You're good with me. Okay. So, but you start to analyze everything that you said and yada, yada, yada. And all of a sudden I'm like, well, did I do this or did I, did I do that? Or, oh, no, I, and like whatever. It's this downward spiral, but it's what our brains are doing all the time. And what does that do? It just destabilizes you. It destabilizes you. We have to recognize the schemes of the enemy, guys. We really do. What does the enemy do? He sows doubt. Like he's a professional doubt sower. He does it with questions. He does it with accusations. He's been doing it since the beginning of time of like, did God really say? Like whenever anyone starts a conversation with, did God really say? I can tell you that person's operating under a crazy amount of deception. Not all, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, oh, that's one of those moments. A lot of times, just give it, disclaimer, sweet, covered my bases. <laughs> Why? Why does he do this? Why does he so doubt? Because confusion, indecisiveness, insecurity, and a lack of assurance are his playground. Like he just has a field day with the indecisive mind. We go through these cycles of revelation and we get really excited. We get a moment of clarity. We get fresh vision and we start down the road and we begin to go after the things that God has for us. And, and then all of a sudden, what do we hit? We hit opposition. We hit roadblocks. We hit a few shut doors. And what do we begin to do? We start to entertain the wrong question. And then we go into this spiral of confusion and, you know, the wind gets sucked out of our, our sails and, and, um, and pretty soon we're reduced to Netflix. It's kind of how my life goes, at least. So, <laughs> derailed, like derailed. We have to begin to recognize a cycle and a pattern in our lives. And the next thing, that's the first step. The next thing we need to do is we need to learn how to shut it down. Like shut it down. You're so much more powerful than you think you are in, in, in this regard. Shut it down. Forcefully. <laughs> Entertaining doubt is a luxury that you cannot afford. Like you cannot afford unless you just want to wallow. But if you want to have a life that's stepping into the fullness of what God has for you, a life of momentum where you're pushing forward into the new, doubt is a luxury that you cannot afford. And I've had to learn this the hard way in a lot of ways because um, i just give you a very personal example. Um, I took a week off just a while ago. <laughs> and um, some of you guys know that I, that I manage the 1 p.m. service. Um, and um, it's been awesome. It's been fun, super challenging. And, um, but it means I'm basically responsible. I don't have to teach, but I'm responsible for, you know, who's going to close the service, who's going to open it up, and, and offering, and so on and so forth. So um, I took a week of vacation, and how many of you guys have had those weeks where you just did not press into the Lord <laughs> like you were supposed to, okay? And, um, and I, I just didn't. I really struggled to read um, my Bible, and, and, um, and literally, I mean, the whole time kind of had that guilty thought of like, I need to read. I know, I know I need to connect. I need to connect, but I just kept resisting it for whatever reason, and I kept filling my life up with a bunch of to-dos and just, you know, stuff that wasn't... Um, that important, and um, all the way up till Sunday morning, and, and I found myself, and I'm driving to church, realizing that I've not pressed in, I've not listened or tried to hear the voice of the Lord, and, um, and, and I'm looking at my team. Now, normally, if I have a great team, then I don't have to do anything. <laughs> at the 1 p.m., I'm making so many confessions, I feel like I'm just blurting out, uh, just being way too honest, okay? But, um, so I'm thinking like, all right, 
all right, I'm not in a good headspace. Probably I don't need to hold a microphone today, so I'm going to pass this off to somebody else. And then I, I start to panic when I realize that there's nobody. There's nobody at my service, which then I begin to realize that I'm going to have to hold a microphone <laughs> at some point. And um, what I begin to realize is that, oh my gosh, I'm tortured right now. And I'm like, and I begin to think, I begin to scramble in my head for some word that I got some other time, somewhere way in the back, rather than asking the Lord for a word for his people. Because why? Because, well, I'm ashamed and I'm, and I just stop myself and I'm like, I'm letting this destructive pattern happen in my head. And I'm like, and I just knew in that moment, I'm like, I cannot do this. Like, I can't do this. So I said, Lord, I'm fully aware I've done a really terrible job at trying to connect with you this week, but this isn't about me, and I need you to speak to me. And I got three things right away, like right away. And I walked in, and it was probably one of the most powerful times I've ever spoke. And people, whatever, it was just like that obvious thing where I made a connection. And I just realized that there are just moments in our lives, guys, there's moments in our lives where, where our instinctual response, for whatever reason, our performance kind of driven, I'm um, super performance driven in, in a lot of ways, but that will cripple us. It'll sabotage us. And we cannot afford to doubt. I hope I'm making sense here. I don't mean you can never have a moment of doubt, but opening it up, inviting it in, giving it a cup of tea, like that kind of thing is, is it will kill your momentum. You need to learn to shut it down. I don't know how many times in worship, this is just another super honest thing, I've been in worship, and, and um, I love holy moments. I love holy moments of the Lord, and um, we've been taught so carefully and so well by Bill to like, like when the Lord's doing something, like we don't want to get in the way, we don't want to mess that up. I have you guys, I don't know, when you, when you feel responsible for like there's something beautiful beginning to happen in worship right now, like I don't, I want to increase this, I want to see it, you know, obviously. And I don't know how many times, like, I've started out, you take a risk, you're like, a song pops in your head, or maybe it's a prophetic thing, and you launch out, you take a risk, and that beautiful thing that was beginning to happen in the room just kind of goes, <laughs> there's a moment right there where you cannot afford doubt. And I have afforded myself that much to my deep pain. <laughs> I've afforded myself that. I've just paid that check over and over and over again, rather than realizing how much grace is available. Like, I, you, you can go through these. You guys know the moments that I'm talking about where you got two options. You can spiral in like, oh, I screwed that up. I'm a terrible person. I'm a terrible worship leader. Bill is super disappointed in me right now. Blah, 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 blah. You open yourself up to that. And man, you just subject the next 30, 20 minutes. I mean, people are just like, I'm, so, I'm just so sorry, I'm terrible. Then sings my soul. Oh, just awful. <laughs> just how did I do that? It's the worst. <laughs> I've learned to shut down. That process like, oh, I hear you coming. I hear you coming from a mile away like, wham, like it's violent, like in my head. I have violent pictures of what I'm doing. In my head, like, no, like, no, you will not. You will not derail me. You will not sabotage me. We are going to keep, <laughs> it's good. We are going to keep pressing in. We're going to keep going after this thing. I have so many stories. Uh, I'll finish this because I really want to go after ministry. Um, number four, be prepared for opposition and attack. Don't be surprised by opposition and attack. And sometimes we just need to grow a thicker skin. Um, I was talking again with Jason. Um, we we're processing and we were kind of laughing at all the things we want to do with our lives that we weren't really going after um, in the moment, but we're deeply convicted about. We're just not actually doing anything about it. And he's like, do you think we're lazy? <laughs> I just began to think about it. It's an honest question. I'm like, I don't know. I began to think about it. I'm like, no, I'm not lazy. What I am is I'm easily sabotaged. 
I take one little soft punch to the chin. And I'm like, my life's purpose is over. You know, like. <laughs> Do we have an arsenal ready for those kinds of attacks? I mean, this is, this is a Bill Johnson message. And, you know, strengthen thyself in the Lord moment. You guys know what I'm talking about? Do we have a set of convictions? Do we have a set of scriptures, things that quickly restore our confidence in the character of the one leading our life? Like, and um, coaching ourselves. I mean, I mean self-talk in the, in the best way. Like, I mean, just talking to yourself. Like, I may not be sure why this door's shut. I don't know what it means, but I'm not going to waste time analyzing it. I'm not going to go down this path that's destructed because I know the one I'm yielded to. I know the one who loves me, and I know the one who's for me, whose promises are more sure than any word that any leader has ever spoken over my life. I'm confident that he will work good in me. He has a future. He has a promise. No matter what disappointments I will face, I know who's leading my life. I know who's leading my life. Be prepared for opposition. Be prepared for attack. It happens. Last, whatever you do, keep moving forward. There's such a difference. I love Bill when he talks about there's questions that, that you ask in the mess hall and in the barracks that you never ask on the front lines. And the kind of questions you ask really uh, give away actually what position you're in. And um, things on the front lines, you, you're not theorizing about the political correctness of war. You're not like, do I believe in war? Do I not believe in war? What did Augustine say about war? Is it something, like you're not thinking. You realize you're being shot at. Someone's trying to kill you. You guys understand? You can have some conversations in the, in the barracks, like away from the front lines, and there's certain conversations you just don't have on the front lines. And the thing you learn on the front lines is that you never stop moving. Whatever you do, don't ever stop moving. What's the easiest target to hit? The one that's not moving. I love this verse in Philippians. It says this, Brothers, I do not consider that I've made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind. Forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. So just keep moving. Like if you have a bad day, if you have whatever it may be, you get sabotaged, you get derailed. I think the most important thing that we can do is just to keep moving. You know who's taught me a lot about this, um, just about every leader I've ever interacted with, but um, Brian Johnson has taught me so much about this, about a guy that, ref I, it, I mean, he has been hit in the craziest, gnarliest ways, and he just never stops moving. I mean, there are times where I feel like, our world's falling apart. It's falling apart. And Brian's like, let's make a project. <laughs> let's do this. Like moving forward. Like, no. And I'd, I'd be like, I would just stall out. Like we have to fix this and fix this. And by the time we fix this, the whole movement would be over. Like to, honestly, that, that's sometimes how, <laughs> how it feels. Like you have to continue to move forward, to press on. like I just yelled at you guys for a really, really long time. Um, um, it's just a season to believe. It never is not a season to believe, but it's just a season to believe. And I, um, I just want to encourage whatever you believe that God has put on your life, just believe it. Like, remove doubt. You know, we don't have any control over the scope of our lives. Um, and this is, again, uh, when I talk about believing it, I, I mean, walk this out with the Lord, like entrust your life to him, but believe the things that he's spoken over your life, like believe the things that he's called you to do. I feel like the Lord wants to restore convictions. He wants to restore things that have kind of fallen out of off the, the shelf, or you've fallen off the horse, or whatever. I just love what Gabe went after. Is that I feel very, very similar that that's something that the Lord wants to do.
Like you once held like a really, really strong conviction and you just don't hold it anymore. Like something in life has kind of stolen that from you. And the Lord wants to restore that. Even just visions, even dreams that you've had for your own life, things that you've long since abandoned and moved on. I just feel like the Lord is calling you to take up arms again, like in the things that you are purposed to do. And again, there's no guarantees that it's going to be a glorious life, but it will be a life where you're multiplying the thing that you were given to steward here on the earth, which is going to be the most glorious. Whether you ever see the fruit of your life, you will have known that I took these talents of mine and I multiplied them. I multiplied them. I gave them. I didn't bury them in the ground. I gave them. I saw them multiplied. Who is that here? Awesome. Can we just pray for you real quick? You mind standing? I'm going to read that verse again over you. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward. Yeah, I just bless you to leave your past behind, to forget, literally forget What lies behind you? And to once more, in this moment, to begin to strain forward. Tomorrow when you wake up with a new sense of purpose, that feeling of failure and regret or things that's just kind of been a shroud over you, yeah, I just command you to go. And that tomorrow morning, you would wake up with a fresh sense of purpose, like your inner being, your spirit would be straining forward, straining forward, pressing on to the goal of the prize of the upward call of God on your life. And I pray for fresh vision, fresh revelation, fresh purpose, fresh conviction, that you would fill journals over the next couple of months with the visions and the things that you would be a fire creatively. Yeah, just increase, Lord. Increase. In Jesus' name, amen. One more. And then I'm going to let Chris. Chris, why don't you just come up? Why don't we stand? I'm just going to pray for, again, the confidence of God to fill this room. Yeah. And um, if you want more confidence in your life, just put your hands out or put your hands up, whatever. Spirit of the living God, right now, fill our hearts with confidence. Fill our hearts with confidence. Confidence in who you are. Confidence in what you want to do through our lives. Confidence in what you want to do on the earth. Confidence in the people that we're in relationship right now that we've lost hope for. Like confidence, like an unshakable conviction. Fill us with conviction again, I pray. Fill the church with conviction again about who they are. Fill us with the conviction of sons and daughters again here on the earth, the authority that we have, the assignment that we have on the earth. Fill us with conviction in our everyday life, whether it be in the home, whether it be in the business realm, whatever it may be, fill us with the conviction of the kingdom of God and the assignment that's on us. Fill us with confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on. Yeah,